going to get going with this next debate on employment and visa reforms in the Senate bill and in some of the ideas the House has put together. Our panelists for this one, I think you know him well by now, Professor Jan Ting, making his third appearance. <laughs> also joining us, Tamar Jacoby from Immigration Works in Washington, D.C., and David Selden, an attorney with the Kavanaugh Law Group here in Phoenix, extensive experience uh, litigating, uh, as well as the case known to many Arizonans, Melendris, the Melendris case, uh, where a federal judge recently found that Sheriff Joe Arpaio racially profiled Latino drivers here in Phoenix. Welcome to you all. We also have Mark Krikorian joining us from the Center for Immigration Studies in Washington, D.C. Sir, thanks for joining us. He's on Skype. Mr. Krikorian, we are going to start with you. You are on the anti-reform side, or I know we've pigeonholed some of you. You may not like it and feel free to disagree, but for the purposes of this debate, you are on the anti-reform side when it comes to what's been proposed on the employment and visa side. So please take up to 10 minutes if you'd like. Uh, Jan Ting has yielded his time to you on your team. Uh, so please take uh, as much time as you like, no more than 10 minutes, please, to outline your position. Okay, well, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, and make sure to, you know, just uh, pull the plug on me if I go too long. Uh, that's the advantage of my being from Skype. You can just turn me off whenever you want. Um, <laughs> but then we might lose you. Well, that's true. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, I think we need, the, we need to start from asking what is the problem that we are seeking to address. Now, for employers, uh, the way the problem is phrased is that, you know, there's a shortage of workers they want. They can't find the right talent that they think they need. Um, as one of uh, Senator Marco Rubio's uh, top staff put it, I mean, a lot of American workers can't cut it. I mean, that's kind of what it boils down to as far, in a nutshell, of what the, the reason for these programs. The other perspective, and I'd have to say this is the one, the, the angle that I come from, is that the problem is that employers have come to uh, expect Congress to procure a workforce for them. Uh, and this has developed into a, uh, you know, a, a dependency, a kind of uh, addiction, if you will, to foreign labor that results in continual and increasingly shrill demands for more and more workers. Now, I'd submit that um, this idea that we have a shortage of labor, a shortage of appropriate labor, is mistaken. And let's just start with the numbers. I mean, there are 60 million people, not adults, not working. This is the highest level of non-work we've seen in a uh, generation or more. There are 20 million people actually looking for full-time work. Either they're unemployed or they are uh, involuntarily working part-time. Uh, and the idea that somehow, you know, this translates into an inadequate workforce nationwide is simply, um, you know, just doesn't stand up to the smell test. And if you look at a longer perspective, from 1979 to 2012, uh, if you look at the wages of American workers in different skill levels, American workers with less than a high school education from 1979 today have experienced a 25% drop in their wages. They're making, after inflation, 25% less money than they were in 1979. And high school only, high school grads who don't have any more than high school, have seen a drop in their wages of 13%. Well, if there were uh, some kind of desperate shortage of high school dropouts, and this is in effect Tamar's argument, is that uh, you know high school dropouts are a strategic resource and we need to import them because we're running out, well, then why are their wages going down? Uh, I mean, unless the entire market system, the concept of markets is flawed and simply doesn't work, then, uh, you know, the idea that we have a, a shortage of less skilled workers is simply absurd. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no human capital problems 
with our workforce. I mean, I, you know, there's no question about it. Uh, I, I see it, frankly, in suburban kids even, you know, coming to work on time, dealing with um, customers, dealing with coworkers, bosses, this sort of thing. These are, you know, this is, these are not made up problems. The problem, though, is that an extensive use of foreign worker programs, whether through visa programs like this, worker visas, or whether through, you know, just uh, high levels of regular immigration, because they all get jobs, too, uh, frankly, actually makes things worse. What it does is it decouples American business from the product, from the outcome of the U.S. education system. And since, uh, frankly, business is one of the most important lobbies demanding that, uh, you know, reform in whatever field it is they're demanding it, the, the concept of decoupling uh, the interests of American business from the product of American education has, uh, you know, I would say, uh, in the long run, catastrophic consequences. Now, what this doesn't mean, as I said, that there aren't any problems. Immigration, though, by eliminating or reducing at least the incentive to address those problems makes them worse. And there are kinds of things that we need to see, I would suggest, that aren't related to immigration. I mean, you know, the recruitment networks that used to find young people and uh, funnel them into, you know, less skilled kind of entry level, first level jobs those recruitment networks have disappeared and they've been replaced almost entirely by immigrant recruitment networks. You know, you have a restaurant, you've got a guy washing the dishes, he seems to be okay, you need someone else, and you say, hey, you got any friends or cousins or relatives? And that becomes the way those jobs are filled and the other ways those jobs used to be filled simply atrophy and disappear. I mean, another problem, and this is a policy problem, it's just not an immigration problem, is the way our welfare system works. In 1996, we undertook a very significant reform of welfare, essentially tying for most people most of the time receipt of benefits to work. What that has done is it had some positive effects, there's no question about it, but it's also led to this explosion of disability, of uh, pseudo disability, uh, and pay receiving payments from Social Security uh, from SSI. And what you have is all kinds of people saying, well, I can't work because I have some, I'm depressed or whatever it is. And so they get a check from the government. Again, this is a way of, uh, th this is one of the reasons that we have significant numbers of people who aren't working. And all immigration does is it serves as a crutch. It eliminates the incentive to address problems like SSI, problems like, or, or opportunities potentially like starting apprenticeship programs. This is something that's actually starting up again. Uh, and, you know, if business has essentially an unlimited access, the, you know, willing workers, willing employees anywhere in the world, uh, you know, why would anybody bother? Why would anybody push for this? There's no incentive to undertake this. So my basic premise is that, let me start by saying, and we'll talk more about sort of details of legislation and stuff later, but the perspective I'm coming from is that the very concept of large scale use of foreign labor is destructive, socially harmful to the United States. All of this having said, let me finish up by, by saying that if we do have any form of guest worker programs, which I'm, like I said, not fond of, but if we do, we need to have a couple of principles that govern them. One is radical simplification. We have way too many different kinds of programs, too many visas. They're running out of letters in the alphabet for visas, in fact. Uh, and businesses, I'd say, legitimately complain that there's all kinds of absurd hoops and red tape you have to go through. But the other point is that the opportunity to use programs like this needs to be based not on employer claims of whether they can or cannot find people. And I would submit not even unemployment rates in occupations, which are kind of artificial things created by the Labor Department. I don't mean they're lies. I mean, they don't really tell you what's going on. Any uh, foreign labor program or the eligibility for foreign labor program should be based on a look at the wages paid in those occupations. 
are they rapidly rising? Because if there is a shortage of labor in any particular occupation, wages are going to go up significantly. And only when we see a sustained uh, increase in wages in a particular op occupation should there be any consideration of um, the potentially new workers from abroad. I don't know if I used up my 10 minutes. If not, uh, Jan, jump in. Otherwise, I'll hand it over. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Ting, he's left you 90 seconds. Oh. Care to use it? <laughs> well, thanks. I guess I'll use my 90 seconds to say, um, you know, there was a lot of praise for guest worker programs in the last panel. I was sort of holding my tongue uh, because I'm sort of a skeptic about guest worker programs. In the United States, we've always traditionally viewed immigrants as future citizens, right? People who needed to be treated with respect because even though they're, they're not citizens yet, they're, they have the capability of becoming citizens and uh, exercising all the rights of citizens, and we need to treat them with respect. It seems to me the notion of a temporary guest worker program gets away from that, gets away from the traditional American view of immigrants as future citizens. And, uh, you know, I, I think you can look at immigration history and say we've always used guest worker programs as temporary expedients. Uh, it's easy to bring workers in when you need them and get rid of them when you don't need them. And they don't really have any rights. Uh, they don't really have any labor rights that need to be, be respected. They're tied by contract uh, to particular uh, employers. Uh, and I think we ought to be wary of, of going there, of expanding the number of workers. Uh, you know, I think Mark has called that the Saudi Arabian immigration system, where you bring in people as temporary workers, use them as long as you need them, and then get rid of them. Um, and I think, as Americans, we ought to be appropriately skeptical of uh, expanding those programs beyond where they already are. All right. Thank you, sir. Now to the pro side. Let's start with Tamar Jacoby. Great. So thank you very much. Thank you to Azir for uh, having this great event. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to build on the economic case that's been made by earlier panelists. I'm I'm looking forward to getting a chance to rebut Mark in the um, in the in the later part of the um, of the debate. But I'm going to start by talking about policy, building on the economic case that's been made by others. And um, I'm going to try to fill out this argument that a lot of people have alluded to earlier that a that a worker low skilled worker visa program is the solution. I'm going to try to explain why I think that's right. And um, I do want to just start by saying to Jan Ting, the, the worker visa program in the Senate bill is not actually a traditional guest worker program in the sense that workers come first on a short-term or temporary visa but do have the opportunity later if they want to make a transition to make a transition to a citizenship track. And also each worker is not tied to one employer as in traditional guest worker programs. They can move around and change jobs and because of that bargain with their employer. So we're, I'm not defending a traditional Saudi Arabian uh, guest worker program. The guest worker program in the Senate bill is a kind of a 21st century better mousetrap. But my argument, my basic argument is that I think a guest worker program is really the solution. It's kind of an, when we when we have the debate on TV or in the media about the immigration about immigration reform, most people think it's about the border and about uh, a, a path to citizenship for unauthorized immigrants. That's what gets talked about. Guest worker programs don't get talked about very much. And my case is that actually, guest worker program, no matter what you think the problem is, in the end, a worker visa program, which is this kind of often overlooked cog in the big, in the big um, reform proposal is actually the most important piece of the proposal. Now, why do I argue that? Everybody thinks the system is broken, right? About half, about from a third to a half of the, excuse me, from a, about between a quarter and a half of the people who think there's a think there's a problem with the system think it's about the border. A quarter to a half, and pollsters ask them, uh, between a quarter and a half of the people who think the immigration system is broken think it's a problem of the border is broken. About 20 to 40 percent think the problem is that, that we have unauthorized immigrants here and we need some answer for them, citizenship, legal status, whatever you have. And my argument is that, the, that a guest worker program, a, a worker visa program, really is the answer no matter what you think the problem is. So before I get to the, what the remedy would look like, let's st step back just a little bit and look at the diagnosis. If you think the border is the problem, what's wrong on the border? 
Like, why do we have so much trouble getting control on the border? And it's the point, the answer, the hint to the answer is it's not that we don't try. We definitely try on the border. As people have said here earlier, we spend inordinate amounts. The spending on the border has doubled just since 2005. The number of Border Patrol agents has quintupled since 1992. It's not that we're not trying on the border, but no matter what we try, control is still eluding us. Question number two, if you think that the problem is the 11 to 12 million unauthorized immigrants here, why are they unauthorized? Why are they illegal? And the hint again here is it's not because people would rather be here illegally. If you're an unauthorized, uh, if you're a, a low income worker, there's no advantage to being here illegally. If you had a legal option, you would take the legal option. Uh, being here unauthorized works for drug smugglers and or, you know, being evading the law works for drug smugglers and human traffickers, but not for low-skilled workers. You get nothing out of it. And so my point is that the both of these symptoms, broken borders and the 11 or 12 million unauthorized immigrants, are caused by the same underlying problem. What is that problem? If you're a low-skilled worker and you want to come to the U.S. to work year-round, not on a farm, there is no way for you to get here if you don't have family in the U.S. We have a program for farm workers. They can come legally. The farm workers are only 4% of the undocumented. We have a program for Ph.D. scientists. They can come legally. But if you're an unauthorized Mexican and you want, or a Mexican in Mexico and you want to work in construction or in a restaurant or in a hotel or in food processing or as a janitor, you have one choice. You can pay a smuggler to walk you across the border or you can pay a smuggler to walk you across the border. There's no other way to get here. And the point is, you know, I'm building on the economic case that's been made earlier. We need the workers, but we have no legal way for them to get here. Well, what's the consequence going to be? They're going to come illegally with all the problems that that creates. Whatever your politics are, if you're upset about the rule of law or you're upset about the humanitarian situ human rights, creating a situation where we need the workers, but there's no legal path, recipe for, for disaster. So I'm not going to take much time in these quick five minutes to talk about how the program should work. Obviously, employers should have to try to find Americans first. There's no question about that. Any program should have that built in. And if they find Americans, they should hire them. Obviously, employers should have to treat both immigrants and the American workers fairly. And they should pay a decent wage. And we can talk about all the details of that. And maybe kind of the most important and not understood point is the program shouldn't necessarily add to the number of low-skilled workers coming into the country, right? The point of the program is to take the people who are now coming illegally and give them a legal way to come. You know, I would argue that supply and demand and market conditions are now we're in about the right ba you know the right balance, and that balance goes up and down depending on the economy. There's one quarter as many people coming now as we're coming before the downturn. The economy works to regulate this. The point of the guest worker program is not to add more people coming. The point of a worker visa program is to take the people who are now coming illegally and giving them a legal way to come. And I'll have to Stop me. pause okay. it there. Very good. Thank you. And David Selden. Thank you. I wanted to begin with an observation. I think uh, Bram has perhaps coined a new phrase uh, today that's an oxymoron uh, in looking at the immigration issue because he said we should compare the Senate plan versus the House plan. And I think in today's day and age, the concept of a House plan is perhaps an, an oxymoron. So it will be nice to see what evolves uh, from the House. But uh, clearly, I think there's everybody agrees the system is broken. Uh, I think the Arizona experience uh, and speaking from the standpoint of being a lawyer who represents employers and trying to assist employers with compliance, uh, you know, the Arizona experience is that an enforcement only or even an enforcement priority approach does not work. Uh, so to the extent that what ends up becoming the House plan is to focus on border security and to focus on enforcement, uh, that alone is not going to work because the economic experience in Arizona over the last five years as Alex's report from the Cato Institute uh, demonstrates has not worked. Uh, it's hurt our economy. Uh, in fact, the Arizona Republic had reported that uh, at one point, there were the same number of empty housing units that there were in Maricopa County was about the same number of total housing units that there are in the city of Tucson. Uh, our second largest city in the state is Tucson. We had an empty city of Tucson within Maricopa County 
uh, because the attrition through enforcement policies of the Legal Arizona Workers Act and SB 1070 drove people out of the state. Yet even during the depths of that uh, recession, we still had clients and employers in Arizona who could not find workers in certain industries. Uh, even in the construction sector, where people were dying on the vine for lack of work, we would have a client who said, I got a contract. You know, there were a couple of production builders that were still building houses, but I can't find the workers to do the work. I have to give it up. Uh, and uh, we've heard several times references today saying, well, the, the market solution to this is just wages should rise, pay more. Uh, the problem with that is that may work on a macroeconomic or uh, a microeconomic level. It doesn't work on a macro uh, economic level, or actually vice versa, excuse me. It doesn't work on, a, on an individualized basis because the individual employer or the individual contractor, if he says, okay, I'm going to double the wages for my low-skilled workers and see if I can find somebody from Detroit to move out here and take this job, uh, they're going to be out of business uh, because that work is going to go to some other company. Uh, and what has happened in Arizona is it has driven the disparity between the underground economy and the, uh, the mainstream economy to be even greater uh, because it's put people who are trying to do the right thing uh, and hiring people as employees and paying unemployment, paying workers' comp, doing all their other kind of benefits uh, are at a much greater disadvantage uh, as the underground economy has uh, been driven more further underground uh, and has caused more people to go into the underground economy from the standpoint of both employers uh, and workers. And that doesn't benefit anybody, uh, including our tax base uh, and all the other kinds of economic activity. And the, the loss of population, the loss of economic activity, the loss of spending power uh, by the people that were driven out of the state and that fled the state is... Uh, you can see it every day if you drive around the west side of Phoenix, drive around South Phoenix, drive around downtown Mesa, and now even in the middle of the Scottsdale Fifth Avenue shopping district, what do you see? Empty stores all over the place. Uh, that's the ripple effect of uh, what happens. I mean, uh, economics, uh, you know, there's everybody, a lot of people refer, uh, who praise trickle-down economics uh, ignore trickle-up economics. Uh, and the fact that uh, Arizona, by being ground zero in this immigration uh, issue, has tried to deal with the consequences of an enforcement-centric approach uh, has hurt everybody, uh, including our business sector, as well as our reputation around the world. Thank you. I want to go to Mark Krikorian now for a response. And, and, sir, I'd like you to respond specifically to some of what David Selden just said. He says the Arizona experience is that it is, it is socially and economically harmful not to have a visa program. You say it is economically harmful or socially harmful to have one. Why is he wrong? Well, first of all, he's not entirely wrong because he is uh, clearly pointing to the efficacy of enforcement. Uh, the fact is that uh, illegal immigrants are people like anyone else, and when they get different signals from law enforcement that, you know, that the party is over, significant numbers of them leave. I mean, the research has shown that there was a very noticeable drop in the illegal immigrant population in Arizona uh, after the Legal Workers Act was passed. Now, it hasn't, frankly, been enforced all that well. There hasn't been a consistent regime of audits, and so the use of E-Verify is not actually as widespread as it needs to be, but even an, uh, you know, partially implemented legislation has had a significant effect in reducing the illegal population. Now, uh, the fact is, uh, when an area becomes dependent on a kind of labor that shouldn't be here and should never have been permitted, the adjustment out of that is going to be painful for some businesses. There's no really question about that. How could it be otherwise? I mean, the the most radical example of that we saw was, uh, you know, in the South after the Civil War. This is a much sort of less extreme version, but it's the same kind of thing. It's no excuse to say that we need to continue to undertake a, a uh, you know, a system of 
large scale foreign immigration simply because reducing the intake of foreign workers is going to you know create adjustment problems that people would rather not have to deal with yeah i get that um but you know when welfare was reformed and people had to go to work instead of just collecting a check they had to deal with real effects they didn't want to deal with either so i'd have to say um you know the experience of arizona shows that the the actual efficacy of enforcement and if we actually undertook it in a comprehensive way you would see a much more uh you know um, palpable result i mean it, uh tamar had said that you know we've tried enforcement enforcement only or enforcement first and it doesn't work well the fact is we really haven't i mean uh, you know the, we've done some steps toward enforcement the border is in fact better uh enforced than it used to be i mean i've walked physically a large part of arizona's border as well as texas's and it's there's no question it's better than it used to be but keep this in mind the border patrol the total border patrol everywhere in alaska and the northern border and puerto rico and in florida as well as on the mexican border all of it has fewer people than the new york police department on top of that we still don't have universal use of e verify nationwide and a large number of the people coming through arizona aren't staying there they're going elsewhere they're going to chicago to la to new york and on top of that close to half of our illegal population came in legally either with uh, laser visas from mexico the border crossing cards or from with student visas or tourist visas from overseas and then just never left and we still do not have uh, a meaningful system to track whether people leave when they're supposed to and then do something about it so enforcement can work we have however not really undertaken it and you know why don't we uh you know the the uh, slogan back during the vietnam was give peace a chance well why don't we give enforcement a chance and we have not done that we've only taken a few baby steps in that direction so far tomorrow so i want to take on this argument of um we we have this bad system that's creating a dependence among employers on foreign workers and what that the, the the underlying assumption or the 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 if you listen to mark what you would think is with the, that the american economy has remained the same you know and back since i don't know 1950 when kids used to work in restaurants and um you know there were there were plenty of uneducated people willing to do farm work and hospitality nobody's talking about how the american economy the american demographics are changing in 1950 close to two-thirds of the people in the workforce were high school dropouts. The number was actually 64%. Today, less than 10% of the people in the workforce are high school dropouts. So the Americans in the workforce are high school dropouts. We used to have a big swimming pool, of, if this is the metaphor, of people willing to do work on farms and clean toilets in hotels and wash dishes in restaurants because they were, that was the appropriate level of education and that was a job that made sense for them. Today, we, that swimming pool has shrunk to a Dixie cup. Now it doesn't mean that we do have people out there that, that do want to do farm work and do want to do hospitality. I'm not saying there's no one in America who wants to, but by and large, our workforce is much more educated than it used to be. And meanwhile, we're still not quite educated enough to be the global knowledge economy powerhouse that we want to be. No country in the world educates enough people to have enough of the PhD scientists and enough of the, 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 the high-end business managers and enough of the innovators. So we're, we have a, a population that's mostly in the middle of the skills and education spectrum. We don't have enough people at the low end, and we don't have enough people at the high end. We don't need as many people at the low end as we used to, because we're a more sophisticated economy. But we still need many. Again, just a couple of more numbers. Um, in 1950, if you took every dollar spent on food, a quarter of it was spent in a restaurant. Today, every dollar spent on food, 50% of it is spent in restaurants. A lot more people eat out in restaurants. So we need more people working in restaurants, many of them low-skilled, but you have a low-skilled guy washing the dishes, and that creates more opportunities, because if you can start more, open more restaurants, for the mid-skilled guy who's the waiter and the better-skilled guy who's the chef and the really skilled guy who's the architect designing the restaurants, low-skilled workers having enough of a base of low-skilled workers helps expand the pie and create jobs for Americans 
Americans with more skill. Last number I'll throw out there on the workforce, the average age of a welder in America today is 46 years old. And that's because the skilled people, at, semi-skilled people, skilled people at that kind of skill level are ba mostly baby boomers who are retiring. We're going to need more people to fill those jobs. Uh, Professor Ting, I want to go to you with something uh, Mark said earlier. He said ex employers expect Congress to provide workers. There is a growing feeling that the visa programs are all about feeding workers to, fast food to the fast food industry, to construction, in some respects to the tech. What do you say about to that? <clears throat> you know, before the last year's election, and you may recall, all we heard from both political parties was jobs, 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 right? Which party was going to be best at creating jobs for Americans? Since the election, silence, right? No one's talking about that uh, anymore. And, and I, in the last panel, I, I read the statistics from the latest jobs report. 20 million Americans uh, unemployed or underemployed. That's just the official figures, right? Uh, and 47 million Americans on food stamps. And whatever solution we come up with uh, has to uh, consider the impact of what we, what we adopt on those 20 million Americans who are uh, unemployed, underemployed, 1.3 million of whom are going to lose their unemployment benefits on December 28th. We don't know what's going to happen to them. Uh, and, and the other 27 million Americans living on food stamps, I'm assuming that 20 million unemployed are, are, are getting food stamps already. You know, Mark has said, if there's a real labor shortage, it ought to be manifest in sustained wage increases. That ought to be a, a demonstration that there is a real labor shortage. And David is saying, well, you know, maybe on an individual case, you, you might have a situation where, well, wait a minute, if I try and wage, raise wages, uh, you know, I'm going to lose all my business to the other guy. Well, if you're going to lose all your wages to the other guy and there's a real shortage that affects everyone, maybe you're not the efficient producer. Right? Maybe you're not the efficient competitor. Uh, and uh, if there is a real labor shortage, wages ought to, uh, there ought to be pressure on wages for rising wages on everybody. Uh, and, and, you know, I do think we need to apply regular market economics uh, on a, a micro level, too. It's only fair uh, to do so. I want to shift the discussion a bit to technology, which plays a big role in border security, also plays a big role in the, in the jobs issue uh, and visa reform. Uh, E-Verify is supposed to be beefed up. Uh, other technological changes are supposed to help track the guest worker program, or whatever program we come up with. Uh, David, why should anybody have confidence the government can manage a program like this, saying this against the backdrop of healthcare.gov and what happened there? Well. <laughs> I was going to say, that, that's a good segue, to, in fact, to follow up on a comment that Mark made to s suggest that we haven't tried enforcement enough. Uh, I mean, we've been trying enforcement for years and years and years, uh, spending a lot of money, uh, and uh, the painful adjustments that uh, he mentioned might happen on an individual basis. I mean, we'd be talking decades of painful adjustments, as evidenced by simply, you know, the government's attempt to uh, roll out a health care uh, website, and we saw how well that worked, uh, to try to track uh, the people who are already here, who are in the underground economy. Uh, it, it is a, it's, it's a task that is, I think, beyond the capability of what the American people will finance out of a federal government if we look at the amount of effort uh, that's undertaken that process. Uh, and in fact, even today, if you drive around southern Arizona, uh, you know, you're going to get, if you, the Bisbee, Sierra Vista, uh, you're going to get stopped by the Border Patrol. Um, it, it happens, it's like an armed camp uh, down there. And it's, uh, you know, we, we have to look at uh, what is a realistic uh, market-driven solution, and that is to uh, really remove the impediments to the economy having the workers that it needs. It's not a situation of the government furnishing workers. The government means to... to but stay out of the way so that the employers can get the workers that they need. Uh, and then the economy will thrive. And in terms of, you know, the jobs, 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 uh, if we had not driven uh, employ uh, people out of Arizona through the interim effects of SB 1070 and the Legal Arizona Workers Act, some of those people would still be here and they'd be spending money and they'd be creating jobs for all the rest of us. Uh, so, I mean, and the experience is that it 
it hurts our economy to drive out uh, immigrant workers. Uh, and it's certainly beyond the capability of the federal government at this point through technology or through uh, even human rights uh, because you know, the experience in Maricopa County has certainly shown that uh, the enforcement level attempted in Maricopa County, which Mark had just described as being anemic, is not one that can enforce these laws without engaging in unconstitutional racial profiling. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there'll be a lot more of that in the future if we have an enforcement only approach rather than simply bringing people out of the shadows, uh, getting them to work, uh, letting employers hire the folks who are suited to do the jobs, and then let's all grow and prosper. Mark, I'd like to turn it over to you. And again, the question about the effectiveness of E-Verify and, and a, tech, a technology the government might, government might use to track uh, these guest workers or visas issued. Well, um, E-Verify is actually, you know, for a government program, actually works pretty well. Uh, the uh, e you know, the comparison to or the context of the Obamacare fiasco is, you know, an important thing to keep in mind. But E-Verify has been slowly ramping up long before it even had that name. Really, it's been, you know, they, the Congress mandated it in 1996. The old INS actually started development even before that legislation passed. And what they did was they took their time. They had pilot programs. They had different you know, they looked at different approaches. They tried different things. It has more than enough capacity to handle all hiring decisions in the United States. Already, something like one third of all hiring decisions nationwide already go through E-Verify. The original complaint, technological complaint, uh, or technology-related complaint about E-Verify was that legitimate workers would be prevented from getting work, you know, that uh, Americans would uh, somehow, uh, you know, be turned away from jobs even though they were authorized to work. That frankly just hasn't materialized. The new complaint and, uh, you know, the, uh, the opponents of immigration enforcement sort of turned on a dime and came up with this new storyline is that too many illegal aliens get through E-Verify. Because, in fact, if you have a fully articulated uh, fraudulent identity that actually is consistent with you, you know, your appearance and your age and what have you, with a real number and a real name and a real date of birth and all of that, you can, in fact, or at least it, you have been, had an easier time of sneaking through E-Verify and getting approved. That's, uh, you know, that's a real problem, but it has been consistently... You know, they've been consistently whittling away at that. So, you know, E-Verify actually, like I said, uh, by the standards of a government program, it works pretty well. And remember, the issue here, as in most areas of enforcement, is not to try to go after every single individual violation. I mean, the, the, you know, violations are still what they are, but you go after the largest employers, and I don't mean go after, but you focus first on the largest employers. The largest employer of illegal immigrants in the United States is the McDonald's Corporation. They own something like half their stores, or half her company owned, I mean, just roughly half her franchises. And they have the largest number of what they call no matches of any company in the country. In other words, where the name that um, the Social Security has doesn't match the number that they've been given. McDonald's, once they get the directive that they need to use E-Verify in hiring, will move toward that. They may not like it. They'll lobby against it. They'll spend bags of money giving it to congressmen to try to stop it. But if they fail, just as they comply with child labor laws and wage and hour laws, big corporations that employ the bulk of illegal immigrants are going to follow the rules. And once that employment, once legal status becomes a labor standard, then you can go after smaller fish, as, as it were, who are, you know, knowingly violating the law, but in a kind of, you know, retail one at a time sense that's much more expensive to go after. But E-Verify can, in fact, address a very large share of the problem. It's not a silver bullet. You need, you know, labor law enforcement. You need uh, visa tracking to make sure people don't stay when they're not supposed to, that sort of thing. But, you know, this is, uh, the government does all kinds of things technologically with some adequate level of competence. I mean, Social Security checks go out and, uh, you know, that works reasonably well. 
everything the government does doesn't have to fail. It's just that the likelihood of it failing is a lot higher. And so you have to be much more careful and aware and deliberate in implementing and, and, and you know, rolling out programs like this. And E-Verify, frankly, has been rolled out in a very deliberate way, and now it needs to be completed. All right, thank you. I want to go to Tamar for a quick response, and then I'm going to take questions from the audience. So I actually agree with Mark. E-Verify is a getting to be better and better, more workable program, and, actually, and E-Verify has to be part of the solution. And more and more employers want to use E-Verify. The employer, around the country, employers are signing up to be part of E-Verify because most employers who hire immigrants want to be on the right side of the law. But the point is E-Verify has to come with a legal way to get the workers. Right now what we're trying to do with enforcement is like prohibition. Like it's a totally unrealistic law, totally unrealistic quotas, and we're trying to enforce that. Very hard to do. Um, Eddie Aldretti, I think, used the metaphor of a 25 mile an hour speed limit on a, on a superhighway. If we have a realistic speed limit, which would be work or a visa quota that matches more of what our labor needs are, then enforcement is much more doable, as today when you know, we have liquor licenses. It's not, it doesn't have to be draconian enforcement. So what you need is a, a realistic quotas, enough visas for the workers to get here, and then, yes, enforcement you verify. I just want to, can I say just a couple of words about how the, about the, set, the visa proposals if being discussed? If you can discussed? do it, how the pro, I mean, let, we let's come, the Senate and the well, Let's come back to that. Okay. I do want to get the audience, uh, audience involved here. Uh, let's go to Clint Bolican back there. Uh, immigration is a way to solve uh, proven labor shortages and think we ought to be looking at, at immigration as an economic growth policy. Uh, every high-skilled tech worker creates uh, roughly five jobs. What we saw in Georgia and Alabama was that when illegal agricultural workers were uh, left the country, we lost huge amounts, billions of dollars of GDP and middle-class food processing jobs and so forth. Um, so we are facing right now a situation where we're exporting agricultural jobs to Central America and China, exporting tech jobs to Chile, uh, to uh, Canada and so forth. And we're also facing a situation where we are barely, if at all, replacing our existing population. So we're, we have fewer and fewer workers supporting older uh, retired workers. Isn't immigration necessary, as the Nobel uh, laureate George Stigler said, as an economic growth policy? Jan, do you want to take that? Well, let me we keep, see. We keep coming back to this, this one issue here. Yeah, exporting jobs, bad, right? But bringing workers in to take jobs rather than have Americans fill them, that's good. Uh, I, I mean, that, that, and I say that with a question mark. Um, uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that that's obviously uh, uh, an improvement uh, over the situation. Um, you know, I, I think we, people have mentioned, you know, health care and McDonald's, and I think people need to think about, uh, everyone agrees, however, however you feel about Obamacare, the thing hangs by a financial thread. Uh, what is going to be the impact on uh, the Affordable Care Act if we uh, bring in lots of people that are going to qualify for subsidies under the Affordable Care Act? What, is, what does that say about the future of the, the Affordable uh, uh, Care Act? And um, uh, I, I just think uh, uh, it's not obvious that, uh, that bringing in uh, unskilled labor uh, is going to have the uh, – is clearly uh, beneficial. I just want to just sort of join this argument. Mm. I mean, your assumption that there's X million people out of work and that, that, that they would be taking the empty jobs, that assumes that workers are all the same, that workers are widgets. Workers are not widgets. Not everybody who's out of work wants to do every job that's available. I mean, whatever, however you count the unemployed numbers, um, businesses say that there are 4 million jobs right now that are empty. So if you, have, if you think we have 11 million unemployed or 20 million, however there are, so why are there 4 million jobs that employers say are empty? And the point is workers are different. They're in different places. They have different skills. Um, nobody, if, if you think 
immigrants are taking jobs. I don't believe they are. But if you think they are, wouldn't you rather have a legal system where employers have to try, by the law and proving it, have to try to hire Americans first and can only hire immigrants if they can't find an American? We have laws now that you've got to hire Americans first, and we all know how that works. You know, people have to take out ads in newspapers uh, uh, so that they can say, hey, I took out an ad and I couldn't find any qualified Americans, so now I need to, I need to fill my job with a, uh, a qualified foreign worker. We know how that system works. Um, I do Don't think have that for the 11 I, million. That's not true. The 11 million people who are hiring unauthorized I, As, as Mark says, them. you know, there are a number of strategies that can be used to, to take the available workforce and shape it and qualify it for the jobs that are available. Um, there's no need to pursue those strategies if you anticipate uh, being able to hire foreign workers. Why, why bother with the cost and training? There's lots of American workers that we know that have special needs, right? They have, they have have uh, criminal records, or they have uh, drug histories, or uh, they have handicaps or disabilities, uh, the things that make them problematic workers. Why go to the trouble of accommodating uh, those American workers if you have uh, an available supply or you anticipate an available supply of foreign labor? You know, I think we need strategies to force employers to say, accommodate these American workers. A lot of them are special needs, uh, and they, they do require some accommodation. But shouldn't our priority be to put American workers back to work, even though they have criminal records or drug histories or, or disabilities and special needs? Don't we want these people employed, too? So I'm a housing contractor in Phoenix, and I should um, slow down the building of the house to hire a disabled special needs person instead of someone There's who's no the need job. to have a special program to recruit people into that, into those positions, uh, it, which is not going to be immediate. It's going to take time, but there's no need to launch a program uh, if, you, if you are able to, to hire from a pool of, of uh, foreign workers. Here, here, here's the thing I've been dying to say, because it's the experience of people living in Arizona that you will not find Anglos to do drywall on a home in August. Uh, you, it is hard to find Anglos to go work at fast food jobs for seven bucks an hour or eight bucks an hour. It's hard to find Anglos to go clean hotel rooms for it's seven. It's not because or, or they're Anglo. An it's because they're more educated. It's because well, they want more money. What, There's a big fight on right oh, now. Is it, is it, uh, well, there you go. Thank you for bringing it back. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. Some, you know that there's a fast food workers effort underway all across the country to raise the wages of fast food workers, right? And I'm sure it's going on in Arizona. It's certainly going on on the East Coast. Uh, and why can't they get the wages up? You know, I, I think McDonald's uh, doesn't feel the need to raise wages as long as they have this big pool of foreign labor that's available. I think. If, if that pool was not available, there would be much greater pressure on McDonald's to raise the wages for the workers that they have. And how much are you prepared to pay for a hamburger or for a house? Yes. I, I, I want to go. We uh, have to pay I more. Go over there. Could, could I, could I, I'm sorry. Could I uh, jump in just as the last comment here? 60 about, seconds, please, Mark. Okay. But, uh, Tamara's question was uh, apt. She said, how much more are you willing to pay for a hamburger? You know what? That's not the government's business. What this whole concept of importing foreign labor because there are supposed shortages or what have you reflects a kind of Soviet central planning mentality. Instead, what we need is a free labor market in one country. Within the United States, you go where you want, you hire who you want, but this idea that employers should be permitted to go outside the brackets of the American labor market if they for whatever reason, in order to meet their personnel needs, is, it seems to me, um, undercuts the very concept of uh, nationhood, if you will. You can argue there should be no limits on the importation of foreign labor, because, and I expect that's kind of Clint's perspective, um, or you can say foreign labor shouldn't be imported for its own sake as labor, but anything in between assumes that the, the bureaucrats, the state, has the ability to decide, okay, this worker we're going to allow in at this wage. The Senate bill sets up a kind of Soviet central planning bureaucracy. To do that, it doesn't work. If it worked, the Soviet Union would still be around. A free labor market in one country, it's a total oxymoron. I mean, it's a recipe for disaster. If we'd had labor markets or any kind of markets just restricted to the to, to 
to governmental jurisdictions over history, we'd still be a bunch of, of feudal city-states, you know, without any international trade or without any exchange of technology or without any exchange of ideas or without any all the productivity that comes from labor exchange. It's a crazy notion. It's medieval. Okay. But people are different from every one of those things. The free movement of capital and the free movement of goods is fundamentally different from the free movement of people because a refrigerator, when you import it, when it breaks, you throw it away. When you import a person, you can't throw him away. And so there's a difference in kind. The free increase in trade should actually eliminate the need for much of immigration because we import the product of people's work without importing the people themselves. Okay, so here's how I'd like to, I'd, here's how I'd like to end this. Uh, it's been a great discussion. We could keep going for a while longer. I see two or three more questions in the audience, so please ask your questions, keep them focused, and we'll take one answer from the panel. Then again, as I did last time, I'll ask the panel to end this by giving us your idea based on what you've heard from the Senate, what you, the House plan as I described it, whatever that might be, what fixes you think it needs to solve the problem. Uh, so let's bring it on home. Stephen. Steven Veramontes with the Libre Initiative. Uh, we're a Hispanic nonprofit organization that focuses on economic freedom. Uh, I, the question that we I don't disagree here on the welfare portion. We believe that is a problem. However, there is a little bit of cognitive dissonance here in that equation when you're saying that employees or American workers won't take these jobs, but you have Hispanics coming to take these jobs from them, and you're saying that they go on welfare. Isn't it that the Americans that won't take the jobs, aren't they the ones that are on welfare, be therefore they're not taking the jobs? I'm just saying, as, as Mark said, that if there is a labor shortage, wages should be rising. Wages should be rising demonstrably in that field. If they're not rising, maybe there isn't really a labor shortage. Uh, maybe people are just trying to hold down wages. Um, so. Is there or is there not really a labor shortage in any particular profession? Right? Market theory says if there is, wages should be demonstrably rising. Okay. Let's go to Dulce. Been waiting. Just let's get the mic over there, Teal. I'm very bothered by the idea that undocumented immigrants or immigrants in general just want to be in the low skill workforce. I myself, um, I have clean toilets um, and the reason that we do that is because we're not complacent and we want to be able to make it at, into the middle class or achieve the American dream of having a degree or getting a house or just be part of the middle class. And had, in, had it occurred to you that immigrants are creating jobs because they open their own businesses in construction companies, they open their own business in cleaning companies, and I've been a witness to that. Um, and although I do appreciate that we are talking about the high skill workforce and because I'm an engineer myself, an electrical engineer, uh, we have to remember the people that are doing the low skill jobs, is, it's, they're also moving up and they're creating jobs. And two, we did pass a 600 million border security bill in 2010, which, um, by the way, I have friends in Boeing who developed the, um, the technology for border security that was a total, totally failure. So we're spending 600 million in technology that is not working. So, um, so a question, please, for the panel. I have a, a comment for the panel. And the reality uh, is, this please, is please, a question. A question, question is, is that of 11 million people that are here that are waiting to immigrate, do you really believe that those 11 million are unemployed right now and once they get status they're going to take a job? Or do you believe that they're employed right now and producing for this economy? I got a let's question say, let's, go to, let's go to Mark uh, for that. Mark Rikorian, did you get that question? Uh, yeah. Well, the fact is that something like 7 million or so of the illegal population, 7 or 8 million have jobs. The others are, you know, their moms at home or they're old or their kids or they're unemployed or whatever. Yeah, there's no question. They're employed. Um, the question, what we're talking about here, though, is not the amnesty or legalization issue. We're talking about, the, frankly, the more important part of the Senate bill, which is the future, huge future increases in immigration. The Senate bill doubles regular legal immigration 
from one million a year to two million a year, roughly, and it doubles the admission of foreign workers almost from something like 700,000 or so a year to well over a million, 1.3, 1. I think you froze up there, Mark. Uh oh, did we lose him? Let me just follow up on, on Mark, Mark's point, which is what is the impact of move, moving that eight or seven million uh, illegal workers who are admittedly in the economy now, moving in them into the le legal labor market where they can compete openly with American workers who are looking for jobs? What is the impact of moving them from the, from the gray market into the open market where they can compete directly with, with American workers and, as Mark is suggesting, uh, tripling legal immigration over the next three years? What is the impact on the American worker of tripling legal legal immigration into the market that can directly compete with American workers over the next three years. Those are questions that I think need to be thought about. The David. impact is it will probably raise the wages of all workers because you won't have a, a subclass of people who some unscrupulous people can exploit. And if there's a legal employment system for those folks, there are a lot of employers who I think will say, I don't want to take the risk of having this person be a 1099 independent contractor, pay him cash, pay him under the table. I'd rather pay him a regular wage like everyone else. And I think the more we can get people out of the underground economy into the mainstream economy, it benefits everyone, including the low wage workers that uh, we've heard so many comments about today. Okay. I'm, gonna have to, I'm sorry, sure, I want to get one more, uh, a new voice in. Sir, you, and I, I'm gonna have to end it with this question over here because we're really running behind, I'm sorry. Just a quick question. Um, every time that uh, I have heard Congress wanted to do something on immigration, a disaster happens. The last one that uh, we had an attempt to do this, uh, I think happened in September, and then we had the Syria big mess that uh, immigration got derailed. And as far as the visas, it's such a cumbersome type of uh, process that one of the things or the facts that I know that I'm aware of, the Department of um, Health and Human Services, right now they have about 30 uh, percent, what is it, uh, vacancies because they can find workers. The question is then, if this time Congress passes immigration, are the first visas that they are going to request are for workers to work in government so they can process the visas for the workforce that is needed? So the question was, do, are the first visas going to go to people working in government to staff this whole visa system? Anybody want to take that? <laughs> um. No, the answer is no. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, um, we haven't talked at all about how the visa programs on the table would work, and um, I guess maybe I'll, I'll roll this into my last comment. You can do that, yeah. Say that. Um, the Senate bill is actually a pretty intriguing new, as I said before, it's kind of a better mousetrap on worker visas. It allows the workers to, workers get visas and employers First, they have to test the market, and they have to try to hire Americans, and when they can't, they can hire a worker, but the workers can actually quit and go to, if they don't like the, the employer, or the employer, employer's exploiting them, or they just don't like the job, they can quit and go to another employer in the program who has tested the market and tried to find Americans. And that's a really good kind of novel idea and would make this a much better program, and they wouldn't go to the government first. The problem with the Senate bill is it's much much, much too small to do what we've been talking about doing, what I've been advocating doing, which is replacing the illegal flow with a legal program. Every year from 2003 to 2009, more than 350,000 immigrant, uh, unskilled immigrants, excuse me, unauthorized immigrants came to the country to work, more than 350,000. The Senate bill starts at 20,000 a year. It's just a joke. But we're not talking, the numbers that Mark was talking about, about the Senate bill doubles the number of immigrants coming, and he talks about, he those out numbers with millions at the end of them. The, the guest worker program we're talking about, the low-skilled worker visa program we're talking about, again, is, the point is not to increase the numbers, it's to replace the illegal flow now with illegal workforce people with permits, and employers have to try to hire Americans first, and at the biggest it would ever get to be would be a couple hundred thousand. Okay, and so let's uh, continue that transition to your solutions, uh, David. If you can keep it to about 90 seconds to two minutes, please. Uh, employers uh, want to do the right thing. Uh, they need a system that's legal, that's convenient, that's efficient, that's economical, 
and that uh, allows them to obtain workers to match the jobs that they have available. And right now, our system doesn't do that. Uh, the Senate bill is certainly an improvement. Uh, it's not a total solution, it's not perfect, but the current system is a catastrophe. Uh, so uh, let's get a better system for legal immigration, for making uh, legalized the uh, underground economy that, that currently exists, and it'll end up uh, helping us all. Because if we don't import workers, we're going to be exporting jobs. As Mark said, uh, while manufacturing, we should just buy goods from other countries rather than having workers here to make them. Uh, and that's a prescription for the United States to fall uh, behind in, in what is a global economy. So uh, let's get the workers we need so that we can all uh, develop and grow the economy, which provides jobs for everyone, including uh, native-born Americans. All right, Janting, a better solution for, for the Senate or the House. Here's my conclusion. As I've said before, if Congress does nothing, we end up with the most generous legal immigration system in the world admitting more legal immigrants every year than all the rest of the nations of the world combined. Um, Congress can, in fact, adjust the number of legal immigration any time it wants. Without this comprehensive bill that has all the trade-offs, I'll vote for your bad idea if you vote for my bad idea, uh, inherent in it. Uh, last thought is from Bill Clinton, who on June 13, 1998, delivered a commencement speech at Portland State University. This was two years after he signed the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. President Clinton said, it's wrong to condone illegal immigration that flouts our laws, strains our tolerance, taxes our resources. Even a nation of immigrants must have rules and conditions and limits, and when they are disregarded, public support for immigration erodes in ways that are destructive to those who are newly arrived and those who are still waiting patiently to come. Thank you. And Mark Krikorian, take 90 seconds to two minutes for your thoughts on how the Senate or House ideas can be better. Thank you. Um, I think an important point that we really haven't talked about here is why are these visa and immigration elements in this so-called comprehensive bill? Uh, Tamar alluded to it. She said basically that by letting in everyone who wants to come, there won't be any illegal immigration. You replace illegal immigration by basically permitting everyone in who wants to come. By definition, you would eliminate illegal immigration. The assumption behind this is that there's really nothing we can do about it, that we need to lie back and pretend to enjoy it because immigration is going to happen no matter what. This is not true. Even illegal immigration is an artifact of government policy. And in, in the, I, I would suggest that we need to look at the immigration issue in pieces. The, the idea of comprehensive legislation is a mistake. And the reference to the illegal population, I think, is very germane here. If you want to legalize and integrate long-term illegal aliens, and some of those people, we are probably at some point going to amnesty, um, then the worker visa and immigration components are directly in contrast, directly in competition with that because they undermine the job prospects and the earning prospects, first of all, of immigrants themselves who have legal status. So my takeaway point here is that the House and the Senate, or the Senate, should not have and the House should not package all of these various parts of the immigration issue into an omnibus Obamacare style thousand page piece of legislation. Each piece should be looked at separately, addressed separately, some will pass, some won't, and that kind of step-by-step -step, uh, responsible small c conservative approach is the way we need to address immigration and not through a vast new system basically written by, you know, bureaucrats that will have, you know, very possibly the same kind of consequences as the Obamacare fiasco has. Mark Rikorian, Jan Ting, Tamar Jacoby, David Selden, thank you all very much. Great debate. Thank you, our audience.